This is a talk about the end of life, so I'm going to start with an ending. On the last day of his life, Socrates told his followers, prepare for death. They were words that were very much on my mind three years ago when my mother was dying, and quite by chance I was preparing a book on ancient attitudes towards old age. They were years that we sometimes call the sandwich years, years when my wife and I were both involved not only in bringing up our own children, but also in making my mother's last illnesses bearable, just as she'd done for my father. And those words came with absolutely no loss of relevance for me, because although philosophical perspectives may have changed and the world may have changed and whatever, nonetheless, one thing hasn't changed and never will, that we're all going to die and most of us are going to grow old while we're doing it. Now, it's something that the ancients tried very hard not to deny, and it made me think that the more prepared we are for death, the more peaceful and calm it will be. And as I was going to visit my mother in the hospital, I came across something that Cicero wrote, in which he said that we're like apples. If we're young and we're contemplating death or dying, we cling to the branch and we resist. Whereas if we're older, we fall naturally. And so I believe that the readier we are for what Philip Larkin calls age and then the only end of age, then the easier a time we'll have, the more naturally we'll fall. The ancients taught me, and they teach us, not to deny old age. I'll be explaining how their responses to old age are different from ours, perhaps, and their conception, their understanding of what old age was is also different from ours, but they nonetheless kept on wrestling with those questions that we need to confront now. They thought about how we should age well, how we should die well, and how we should prepare for what comes next, the world that we leave behind, so that we can be fit not only for our own futures, but also for that of the planet we leave. Now, the ancient Greeks didn't exactly deny death, but like the Romans, they fantasized about what it would be if we didn't have to die. They did this in myths. So, for example, there's the myth of Admetus, who was given the chance not to have to die. There was a catch, so long as he could find somebody to die in his place. So he went straight to his parents. Nice choice. Uh, if you think that those conversations you have when you're applying for a loan to the bank of mum and dad are difficult, well, this was a really tough one. And his parents turned him down, which is good because it's a sign that they had learned how to live a prosperous and comfortable old age. But I sometimes think that we have our own myths. For example, there's a widely admired TED talk presented by a doctor, Nia Basilei, in which she enthuses about the progress that's been made with drug therapy and dream gene therapy. Now, some of these have terrible side effects, and it's worth bearing that in mind, because it seems like that kind of thinking makes us want to cling all the more dearly to that branch. So, for example, there's a drug called rapamycin, which might be very good for stabilizing the heart rates of rodents, but try it on humans, and you get lower immunity and higher inflammation. There's also a diet called calorific restriction, which apparently makes people feel really miserable while they're on it. So it makes you think of that old joke where you go to a doctor and you say, Doctor, how can I live longer? And the doctor says, well, cut out the booze, cut out the fags, and cut out the sex. And you say to the doctor, will that really make me live longer? And the doctor says, I don't know, but it'll feel that way. <laughs> so there really has been a lot of research. There's even a $1 million prize put up by the Palo Alto Foundation for anyone who can cure the disease of aging, to cure old age. I just want to think about that phrase for a moment. Is it so ridiculous? Well, the ancients thought of old age as a disease. Aristotle did. Seneca, the moralist and the tutor of Nero, he thought that old age was a disease, but he at least said this, it has no cure. The second century AD physician, Galen, he concluded that it was indeed a disease, and he didn't anticipate a cure, but if you knew yourself and you knew your own temperament, then you could at least mitigate against the effects of it. And he said, for that reason, 
Some people grow old at some times and others at others. I just want to note for a moment Galen's vagueness about what old age is, because if I'm to argue, and I do, that old ancient attitudes towards old age are helpful to us, then we need to think about how they defined old age, what it meant to them, and how it stacks up against our understanding of old age. So, in the UK now, uh, figures for longevity have been going up since Victorian times, although there's just a sign that they're beginning to stabilise, that we're beginning to recognise that there are limits to how long someone can live. So, a woman in the UK can be expected to have a life expectancy of 82 years, um, opposed to a man who may live until 79. In um, <clears throat> West Dorset, the Office of, Office of National Statistics anticipates that by the year 2036, 39% of us will be above the age of 65. Um, coincidentally, 2036 is the year when I turn 65, and I live in South Somerset, where there'll only be 33% of us. So if you don't mind, I'll probably do my shopping my side of the border, because it'll take a long time to get through those queues in Waitrose. <laughs> Uh, let's pan, though, to the ancient ideas of growing old, and we're looking at what most scholars agree to be a steady figure of between 27 and 29 years of life expectancy. Now, if that sounds dramatic, we do have to factor in very, very high rates of child mortality. But once you were past those ages, the longer you'd stayed alive, the better your chances were of making a really quite great old age. So, in ancient Rome, it's perfectly possible that about 3%, not much, but 3% of the population could have been over 80. And in ancient Athens, you could reach a very old age indeed. The figures we have, when you check them, it's still very likely that the ancient Athenian orator Gorgias possibly made it to 105. Now, that means that the ancients had two perspectives at once on old age. They saw it, they recognised it, they honoured it. But also, they were surrounded by death. Death in childbirth, death of children, death in war, death in famine, death by disease, alongside death by old age. So they were constantly asking those questions. And so they would talk about things like how we could maintain our looks, how we could prepare for retirement, how we could maintain our strength both in our minds and in our bodies. And they thought about what would happen afterwards. They gave thought to such questions as, is assisted suicide or suicide ethical? When, as they would say, you knew how the play would end and you wanted to leave early. So, for example, with looks, it's fair to say that they were most of the time all over the place. Aristotle, genius, he did say that baldness was a symptom of an overactive libido because the brain would overheat the scalp and the hair wouldn't grow. And so if you think about those old T-shirts that say, I'm not bald, I'm just a solar-powered sex machine, well, according to Aristotle, they had a point. <laughs> um, Marshall would make fun of people who dyed their hair. Ovid would tell you to, where to go and buy a wig. It's just by the Temple of Hercules in Rome. And he had this extraordinary face pack uh, recipe, which he hands down to us. So if you want to try this at home, it involves honey, 10 eggs, 12 narcissus bulbs, um, spelt, vetch, gum, and a ground-up heart's horn, all of which has been milled by a giant stone pulled by some mules. Um, he also had a prescription which involved crocodile poo, depending on how you read the text. Um, that said, when the ancients did depict old age, such as Romans doing statues of their ancestors, they would confront it with a frankness and an accuracy that you almost think you have to wait till Rembrandt's time to see again. About retirement, they bring us up short as well. Plutarch said that if you want to go into public life, very late in your life, or to carry on in public life, you need to start early. He conjures up this extraordinary image of people who dress up for a Bacchic revel, but they've arrived two days late, and nobody wants that, just looks awkward. Um, as for growing old in our bodies and maintaining that, um, they do prepare you to they, they do, Cicero says, for example, that old age inherits the body that youth has handed it. 
Now, I'm a teacher as well as a parent, and so that makes me think I should be telling everybody, get in early, stay fit early. I'm slightly comforted, though, by a French geriatrician whose name is Olivier de la Doucette, and he says, well, you can't improvise a program for staying fit at the very end of your life, or when you're 75. You have to start early, 60. I think, Phew, I signed up for the park runs just in time. Um, as for the mind, Cicero's got a good tip, that you remember, you summon up everything that you've done and said and all the exchanges you've had at the end of a day, so you review that and you keep the brain ticking over. The ancients were alive to the idea that you did lose the mental faculties, and they even identified something we could now call dementia. Galen called it morosis, and he did come across patients who were now forgetting their own names in old age. Which brings us to that very serious question of whether or not we should end our lives when it becomes unbearable. For this, it's possible to divide ancient attitudes into two different schools, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, they didn't exactly take the approaches that you'd expect, perhaps. The Epicureans had spent a lifetime avoiding discomfort, and so for them, to end their own lives early was almost an admission that they'd failed. The Stoics, on the other hand, had to find out what plan the universe had for them, what the gods intended, what was the virtuous path. And if that virtuous path was to end your life, that's what you had to do. There's a really extreme example of this. It's the philosopher Zeno who actually founded the Stoic school. At the age of 72, he was talking with his students and he left them, he stubbed his toe, he broke it. And then he lay down, and he said to the heavens, do you think I can't take a hint? I'm coming already! And then he held his breath and died. <laughs> now, I don't want you thinking it's worth throwing in the towel if it all gets a bit much, because you've heard an anecdote about a Stoic philosopher in a TEDx talk. And I'm saying that because we need to be cautious about over-applying the lessons of the ancients to old age. For example, they said very little about social care, if anything. And they, they imagined that all of this would take place within the family. Lawmakers in ancient Greece and Rome, Athenian comedians and Latin satirical poets, they would often identify people who defaulted on this and mock them. That does suggest that they did have problems with keeping that and keeping people in the family, but then so do we. And we need to think about what happens when care within the family becomes sometimes unbearably difficult. This is why I regard with caution the attempts to make easy assumptions about other cultures. And Jeremy Hunt did just that in a speech he made in 2013, looking east to China and saying that in Far Eastern societies, residential care is a last rather than a first option. Actually, there's been a rather more balanced discussion recently in the House of Lords about how we can redistribute, redistribute our resources between the young and the old. And I think, even though that's a different response and a different solution, the House of Lords, not a body known for its youth, is thinking about the children of the future. And I believe that's a very ancient value, one that the ancients cherished. And so I want to end with an image that Cicero gives us of neighbours of his who are working intently on filling their barns and tilling their gardens. Cicero remarks, this isn't perhaps surprising since nobody is so old that they don't want to add another year to their lives. But what does surprise him is that they are engaged in something which has absolutely nothing to do with them. And then he sums this up with a line from the poet Statius, who says of someone in a similar position, he plants the trees to help another age. I'd like to think that at their very best, that's what the ancients did for us. Thank you very much. Yeah.